Hello, uh, today I will present you a project on cell signaling in secondary neuroregulation. This project has been started and mostly carried out by Elena Gonzalez Bobar in Elisa's Martin lab. And now I am continuing it. It is entitled Cell Intercalation Driven by Smart Free Activity Underlies Secondary Neural Tube Formation. The, the dynamic morphogenic process that uh, shapes the neural tube is called neurulation. We can find two types of neurulation depending on the rostrocaudal level. Uh, rostrally, neural tube is formed by an invagination of the ectoderm in a process called primary neurulation. Failure in primary neurulation is associated with open neural tube defects, such as anencephaly or open spinal bifida. Caudally, the, the neural tube is formed from the, the cells that are contributing to the elongation of, of the embryo in a process called secondary neurulation. Failure in secondary neurulation is associated with closed neural tube defects, such as spina bifida occulta. Today, we are gonna focus on secondary neurulation, but this is a process much less studied than, than primary neurulation. In the chicken embryo, we can, we can follow the, the whole sequence of events uh, of secondary neurulation if we go from the, from the caudal tip of the, of the embryo until the last pair of somites. So while the tail bud uh, is where are these cells that I mentioned before that contribute to the, to the elongation of the embryo, the neuromesodermal progenitors. As uh, secondary neurulation starts, these cells are confined uh, inside the basement membrane and they suffer, uh, suffer a lineage restriction. They lose their mesenchymal identity and they acquire neural identity. Later on, these cells undergo a mesenchymal to epithelial transition. They elongate and they polarize to form uh, multiple fossils that are gonna appear in between the epithelial and the mesenchymal cells, as we can see here. During lumen resolution, these multiple fossae are going to coalesce in through bigger lumens that eventually will, will coalesce into a single lumen to form the, the final neural tube. In order to search for the signals controlling this, uh, this process, we perform, we perform a screening by in situ hybridization. By doing so, we observe the, the expression of some components of the TGF beta pathway correlates spatiotemporally with secondary neurulation, especially uh, TGF beta 1, one ligand of the pathway, and SMAP3, one of the main effectors of, of the pathway. Moreover, by an oval extrapolation, we have seen uh, that uh, using a, a transcriptional reporter of TGF beta pathway, the character GFT vector, we have seen that the, the pathway is transcriptionally active at the level of secondary neurulation. You can see here that at more caudal, more rostral levels, like in the two pair of somites where the tube is already formed, the, the signal is much lower than in the than in caudal regions. Okay. To interrogate for the for the role of uh, the TGF beta pathway in, in this process, we we perform some loss of function experiments with knockdown SMAT2 and SMAT3, which are the main effectors of the TGF beta pathway. Meanwhile, in SMAT2, we did not observe any significant phenotype at the, at the morphogenic level. Uh, a, neural, a normal neural tube uh, indistinguishable for, from the wild type is formed. In the knockdown of um, SMAT3, we observe a multi-lumen phenotype. Here, we, the, the lumens are labeled by, by SO1, an apical component marker in this transversal section. In the dorsal view, we can see the lumens labeled by encarry. Okay, so now we wanted to, to go step by step in the whole process of neurulation to find at which point is SMAT3 required for the, for the secondary neurulation. So we start since the beginning, at the lineage restriction point. So uh, neuromesodermal progenitors, which are dual fated cells, SOX2 positive, which is a, a neural identity marker and bra positive, which is a mesenchymal identity marker, must lose the the T bra the T bra, the T bra activation, and they should maintain the SOX2. As we can see here, we follow the whole process, um, assessing the endogenous levels of T bra by by immuno, and we see that as uh, the secondary neurulation progress, 
the, the DRA is down regulated and at the end of the process, it is only restricted to the notochordia. Meanwhile, SOX2 is upregulated along the process and at the end, the whole neuroepithelium is uh, SOX2 positive. What happened when we knock down uh, SMAD3? Uh, pretty much the same than in the wild type. Basically, the, the TBRA at the end of the process is restricted to the, to the notochord, as in the wild type, and the whole neuroepithelium is SOX2 positive. Thus, we can conclude that SMAD3 is dispensable for the downregulation of TBRA and the maintenance of the SOX2 expression. So, we move on to the, to the next step in the, in the sequence, which would be the mesenchymal to epithelial transition and lumen initiation. In wild type, this, uh, this uh, lumen initiation occurs always at one cell distance from the basement, mem basement membrane, here labeled in green by laminin. When we look at the SMAT3 knockdown, we see that again, it happens pretty much the same. The multiple fossae appear and the multiple fossae appear at one cell distance from the basement membrane. Here we have the quantification. Moreover, the, the SH SMAT3 cells are able to elongate as they are the control cells. They are able to locate the centrosomes here labeled by FOB in the, in the apical pole as the wild types, and they are able to enrich the apical poles, the apical pole in apical components like SO1 and coloring or atypical PKC. Thus, we can say that neuromesodermal progenitors mesenchymal to epithelial transition and lumen initiation occurs at one cell distance from the basement membrane independently of SMAT3. Now, the question would be how this uh, multiple fossae coalesce to form a single lumen. Here, we can see in the, in the movie uh, how the basement membrane is deposited here in, in purple and how the multiple fossae appear, they coalesce in three, in three bigger lumens, one dorsal and two ventral. And the, these three lumens are gonna eventually coalesce into a single one as the central cells are clear off. You can see here how they are clear off. Now, the question is how these cells are clear off from, uh, from the middle. To, to address this question, we wanted to move to, to in vivo imaging to track the cells in vivo. To do so, we benefit from the expertise of Bertrand Benazaraf uh, lab in chicken in vivo imaging. And together we set up a culture condition that uh, does not affect uh, chicken embryo elongation, with chicken embryo elongation and blood vessel formation as we can see here in the movie. You can see here how the blood vessels are formed. Combining these culture, condi these culture conditions with our electroporation, we were able to track the cells during secondary neurulation. Now that we have this tool, we can tackle our question, how the cells are cleared off. We have seen that the cells are cleared off from the center always uh, after one cell division. After one cell division, the cell that will be cleared off is uh, is, um, it, it gets away from the, from the center and it loses circularity as they elongate. So basically what they are doing, uh, as we can see here in the, in the images, they intercalate into the epithelium. So now that we, that we know how they are clear off, we want to, to check which is the, the frequency of, uh, of these events in the rostrocaudal axis. So when, when we look at the caudal tip of the embryo, we see that uh, after division, both daughter cells tend to remain central. Meanwhile, in, in more medial regions, one daughter cell remains central and the other gets intercalated. And in the most rostral regions where the lumen resolution is more intense and more prevalent, both uh, daughter cells tend to, to intercalate. Now we want to address what, uh, what happened when we knock down SMAT3. Does, does SMAT3, uh, uh, is, is, is SMAT3 necessary for, for cell intercalation? And actually it is. When we repeat these experiments, knocking down uh, SMAT3, we observe that no matter the rostrocaudal distance at, way, at which we are looking at, the cells tend to remain central. Here we can see an example that upon division, both cells remain quite nicely central. 
Moreover, we have seen that the knockdown of SMAT3 also reduced the velocity of the cells and the distance traveled of, of these central cells. So we can conclude that the SMAT3 is required for cell intercalation and, and it regulates motility of uh, central intercalating cells. Okay, an interesting feature of, uh, of these central cells that must be cleared off is that they are much less packed than the, than the peripheral cells. In other words, they have less cell density. The main uh, molecular sensor of, uh, of cell density is JAP. The activity of JAP, uh, as a, the, the readout of the activity of, of JAP usually is the, the nuclear JAP. When we, when we check at the, at the, nuclear, le uh, the nuclear levels of JAP, in central and in peripheral cells, we have observed that central cells have significantly more nuclear gap than, than the peripheral one. This actually makes sense because it has been reported that uh, SMAT3 and JAP physically, um, oh, sorry, that is, uh, this actually makes sense because of the difference in cell density. But now, uh, taking into consideration that SMAT3 and JAP physically interact, and they, they can be co-translocated to the nucleus and form a complex to, to perform transcriptional activation. When we look at the knockdown of, of SMAT3, we observe that this knockdown of SMAT3, this loss of function of SMAT3, affects the levels of uh, nuclear jab. <clears throat> then we can, we can say that SMAT3 activity affects nuclear cytoplasmic gap ratio in central intercalating cells. Since, as I mentioned before, they had been reported to form a transcriptional complex, we wanted to check whether this, uh, whether JAP could have an effect in TGF-beta uh, activity. So we went back over our CAGA 2 TGF reporter. As I mentioned before, this is a reporter of the transcriptional activity of the TGF-beta pathway. So we have seen that in central cells electroporated with the SHSMAT3, there is a down regulation of the TGF beta of the TGF beta activity. Meanwhile, JAP alone is not able to significantly change the, the activity of the pathway. When we combine both, JAP is able to rescue the, the SMAT3 the, the SMAT3 loss on function phenotype, at least at the level of the at the transcriptional level. But actually, it is also able to, to rescue the, the phenotype at the morphogenic level. Here, we, we show again this uh, multi-lumen phenotype with, that we show at the beginning with uh, SHSMAT3. JAP alone is not, uh, that does not induce any, any phenotype, but when we combine both, JAP is able to rescue the normal single lumen um, uh, condition. Okay, so just to, to sum up uh, in this presentation, we have so data that proves that lumen resolution in secondary neural tube um, requires uh, intercalation of central cells driven by SMAT3 and JAP activity. Just to finish, thank you, thank you all for your attention. If you have any questions. Thank you very much, Jose. That was great. Hello, thank you. You already have questions. So uh, Kaiser Kolovsky is asking, uh, did you have a chance to check what happens to the lumen in central cells when you overactivate or overexpress the SMAD3? Yeah, actually we have, uh, we have checked, we included into the presentation for the sake of, of timing, basically. We, we do not observe any, any phenotype at the level of multilumens. The, the, the shape of the neural tube was kind of normal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Aidan Martins is asking, is cell division necessary for central cell clearing and lumen resolution? We, we have not tried to, to block the, the, the but to affect the cell cycle or block the, the divisions, but we just we have observed that the, the intercalation always happens after one cell division. That's mm -hmm. what we can see so far. Um, 
Agatha Cheney is asking, since cells are cleared off after cell division only in some parts of the embryo at a given time, is the orientation of the mitotic spindle different in the different parts of the embryo? <laughs> that's that's uh, very interesting, actually. We, we haven't checked. It would, be, it would be a nice thing to look at. Okay. And Catherine Brown asks, in wild type, you show that after division, one of the daughter central cells remains, one of the daughter cells remains central. What then happens to that central cell? Do all the cells eventually intercalate? Oh, sorry, maybe I didn't clarify it properly. So I think, I think what Catherine's asking is, after an intercalation event, what happens to the sister cell that hasn't intercalated, that's in the central region? Does that also intercalate? Uh, so in, in the control condition, probably what is going to happen is that this central cell is going to divide again, and eventually both daughter cells are going to intercalate. So, so the central cells are all cleared off, and, and we end up with a single lumen or a cube. Exactly. And just to follow up on that, I was wondering um, how similar, how comparative this is to uh, zebrafish, so teleost neurulation, where you see that uh, mitotic division and then cells intercalating on opposite sides of the neural tube. So very different from sort of the classic primary neurulation. Yeah, actually, uh, here when we when we observe the, these divisions where both cells intercalate, they they didn't necessarily go one in each side of the of the neural tube. Sometimes they they go both in the same. Actually, if I remember well, in the in the picture that I show in the presentation, both of them are in the same in the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, question: Is TGF beta acting in an autocrine or paracrine manner? <laughs> uh, we don't know. We know that it acts in autocrine manner. At least we don't know if it also do it uh, paracrine. And I guess sort of a related question from Julia Buzo, uh, in which cells is the ligand TGF beta one expressed? Um, we haven't checked. Actually, uh, maybe we, we, we should go uh, through the through the in situ screening because in the in situ screening we had checked for the TGF beta one ligand and actually apart from SMAT3, it was the, the other one that shows a quite a specific uh, expression pattern. That, that correlates with the, with the process of secondary inoculation. Maybe it will be worth it to look again at, at this thing. Oh, great. Thanks very much. Thank okay. you.